this is just the beginning. Welcome to post-COVID economy, reimagining capitalism in America. I'm Felix Salmon. I'm the chief financial correspondent at Axios. I'm coming to you from my home in New York. Many thanks to Omidya for making these conversations possible. And welcome to all of our audiences on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Axios.com. You can follow along using the Axios events hashtag and at Axios on Twitter. And over the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to explore how the coronavirus has worsened economic and racial inequality in America and how people are working to change the status quo, capitalism as we know it, and try to build something which is more equal and democratic. And in order to do that, you need legislation. So our first guest is very central to this entire project. It's representative of Washington's 7th Congressional District, Ramila Jayapal. She is joining us from Seattle, Washington. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. It's awesome to have you here. So I have, um, I think I'd like to start just by asking you, um, what have we learned about capitalism over the past six months or so since the pandemic hit America? What what have you learned about capitalism and what whether it might have un, weaknesses that we hadn't previously suspected? Well, I actually think we had seen many of these weaknesses before the pandemic hit, but the pandemic has just brought a very bright light to all of them. Remember that prior to COVID hitting, we already had 87 million Americans who were either uninsured or underinsured. We had 40% of Americans who didn't even have 400 bucks in their bank account before COVID ever hit. And I think that this is the result of a capitalistic system that has been far too unregulated, far too focused on greed and profit for a very wealthy few, and then no social safety net that was established to make sure that the people who were most vulnerable did not slip through the cracks. And so when you have an economy where 90% of uh, GDP gains go to the top um, 10% of people, which is what's happened in the last decade, you have necessarily a deep inequality. And of course, that also uh, exhibits itself on the racial uh, side as well. You know, most of the, so, so much of the disproportionate burden falls on black, brown, and indigenous communities. Then you see COVID hit and right. a lack of government intervention uh, early on at the scale that matches the scale of the crisis has just worsened all of that. So you mentioned the $400 statistic, which is a series which is put out by the Federal Reserve, and it measures how many Americans have basically, as you say, $400 in their bank account in case of emergency. And one of the interesting things about that time series is that it's jumped up quite a lot since COVID. The $2 trillion plus that the federal government came in to spend in April, a lot of that really did go to those kind of um, people who didn't have $400 in their bank account. Many more of them, well, substantially more of them do now than they did before. We saw a big fiscal and monetary attempt to rescue the economy from the deepest recession that any of us have ever experienced. And it all came top down from the government. So I guess my question is, is that really your vision for how society should work is that we can rescue, we can, we can address inequality, we can give people more money by doing the kind of thing that we did in April with the CARES Act? Well, what I really think we should have done immediately, because we do have, uh, you know, we have an economy where jobs are linked to any number of other things, including benefits, including health care. That's not the system I actually believe we should have. As you may know, I have the uh, Medicare for All bill in the House, which would move us to a guaranteed um, health care system where everyone would have health care and it would not be tied to your job. So that's the first thing I think 
that's a critically important piece. But given the economy that we have, I proposed the Paycheck Recovery Act, which is a bipartisan piece of legislation. It has tremendous support, um, including from uh, the chief economist at Moody's, Mark Zandi, um, Nobel Prize winning economists like Joseph Stiglitz and others that I worked with on this bill. And the goal here is to do what Germany, South Korea, Singapore, Malaysia, a number of other countries have done, try to keep people in their jobs. And there's multiple reasons for that. Um, but what it would, what the Paycheck Recovery Act would do, separate from the Paycheck Protection Program, which went through banks, the minute you go through banks, you limit who gets that recovery. And that's exactly what we've seen with PPP. Paycheck recovery would say the federal government would immediately subsidize the salaries and benefits of workers to keep them in their jobs, to provide certainty to them and provide part of the operating expenses for businesses to weather the crisis. The theory being that if you have certainty and stability for people being able to get their paychecks, um, that you limit the number of people that end up going on to unemployment, a system which over the course of American history has been diminished time and time again in different states, very different in different states across the, across the country. So when you overload an already diminished system of un unemployment, you essentially limit a whole bunch of people from getting any kind of support. So if you do the Paycheck Recovery Act and you expand unemployment and you uh, provide additional relief similar to what we did in CARES, that would have been the kind of comprehensive package where perhaps we could have kept unemployment numbers lower. And by the way, when we ever have a recovery, uh, the Paycheck Recovery Act allows you to sort of gradually scale open and close because we know the virus is not just going to go away. We're going to have to be dealing with right. this over time. And it's not just aimed at the virus, is it? Like the Paycheck Recovery Act, the idea is this would be a permanent part of the U.S. fiscal architecture, and that whenever there was a shock to the American economy um, and unemployment goes above, I believe, 7%, is that the number in your exactly. bill? That exactly. Employers would be able to get, uh, would automatically get uh, extra money to pay their stuff in proportion to the amount that their revenues had decreased. And that would just exist in perpetuity. And whenever there was a shock, that would kick in. And it would have kicked in, obviously, with, with COVID, and it would have meant fewer people needing to claim unemployment. Exactly. And that's actually what Germany did, as you know, um, coming out of the last recession, they implemented something like this. It's an automatic stabilizer to the economy. And it stays in place, so it doesn't require congressional approval and therefore congressional bickering over what a package should or shouldn't be, it automatically kicks in. And again, working with economists across the political spectrum actually was able to get a proposal where 7% is still high unemployment, but you can get to that level of unemployment without a dramatic set of shocks to the system. So people felt like that was a place that made sense then for congressional intervention to see what other things might be needed at that point. Um, and so this is a this this provides that kind of certainty and stability. It doesn't necessarily say that businesses aren't going to close over the long term. There will still be closures and reshuffling of the economy, but it provides almost a, uh, a rest period to be able to assess what is the best way for those businesses to move forward, what changes need to be made. And again, stability, because when you have people lose their jobs, you now have to figure out how to get them health care, how to make sure they're paying their rent, that we don't have more people who are homeless, who are being evicted. And moratoriums don't do it. You know, moratoriums just delay right. the pain. But they we're going to have to deal with the consequences. So Germany has done this. We have a question from an Axios reader in Washington, D.C., basically saying, what are, the what are the countries who are doing this right? I guess you would say... Germany, which does have a much lower proportion of businesses going bust, it has much less churn. Um, it's a bit less red-bloodedly capitalist in that sense. It's a bit harder to start a business. It's a bit harder to close a business. It's a bit harder to fire people. That kind of softening of the of the capitalist um, tendencies. That's basically your your model. What you want to start moving towards. 
Well, I think that that's a very defensible model for a country that has invested so much into the idea of capitalism. Um, I think the idea that the government should provide this deep safety net and should be there, and also that there are some things that should not be left to a capitalist model, um, like healthcare, for example, that that is a guaranteed government uh, provided benefit. I think there's some combination of those things. Of course, if we were starting from scratch, we might design this very differently. But the reality is Germany, uh, of course, most of the most of the countries in Europe, but also these countries in Asia have put this in place. You know, I remember um, being in Singapore. Uh, I lived in Singapore for some period of time. And what's interesting there is, again, there was a very articulated um, philosophy that if you did not provide a sufficient government safety net, that you would actually hinder the chances of rapid economic growth, even in a capitalistic model, that you would ultimately have so much inequity that you would not be able to have a stable economy, much less, uh, you know, protection of, of, uh, a protection of a democracy. And so I think that that is the idea here, at least given where we are in this country, that we're not saying everything needs to stop being run. Um, you know, there, there are some things, I'm not asking that computers be produced by the government, but I do think that healthcare should be given by the government. I do think that we should invest in education. I do think we should invest in many of the things that reduce inequality in the long term, and that government should be there to step up uh, to protect wages, workers, businesses, in these times of extreme shock, where if you don't invest that money now, believe me, we will be paying for this recession far more than had we done the Paycheck Recovery Act back in, in March, um, when, when we really saw the scale of COVID. Or even back in 2006, before the, the previous recession, and it would have even kicked better, in back then as even well. Even better, absolutely. But, you know, if, if the best time to do this was, uh, what? 12 years ago. The next second best time to do this is tomorrow. Um, thank you very much for um, walking us through this proposal, which um, definitely helps to reconsider what capitalism could look like in, in America, make it a little bit more European. Um, and thank you for coming on to Axios.com. Well, thank you so much for having me. And this is a really important conversation. As you say, let's act immediately. Uh, why be stuck in all the mistakes of the past? We certainly need to be making these changes right now. Thank you to the Honorable Pramila Jayapal for joining Axios. Thank you to our sponsor, Omedia. And up next, we have a View from the Top segment with our CEO, Jim Vanderhey. He's going to be talking to the CEO of Omedia. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Felix. It's now my pleasure to bring you a conversation with Mike Kabzanski, who is the CEO of Omidyar. Uh, Mike, thank you for joining us from D.C. across the river. Uh, tell our viewers, what does the Omidyar Network do? Great. Thanks, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Omidyar Network is a social change venture that was started by Pam and Pierre Omidyar. Pierre is the founder of eBay, and so we come from technology and from markets, and Silicon Valley is really in our DNA. Our mission is a world in which all individuals have the social, democratic, and economic power to thrive. We work with partners across a broad group of funders, investors, think tanks, businesses, advocates, and we employ a full range of tools, whether it's grant making, investing, advocacy directly, and other things. And we do that in the service of three areas. One is around technology to make sure technology lives up to its immense potential to be a source of good in the world, but also to balance innovation and responsibility. Second, in an area we call pluralism, which is about creating the civic space where everyone in society can meet as equals. And the third is the area we hope to talk more about today, which we call reimagining capitalism around the structural changes we need to our economy to make sure that everybody in the economy can thrive and not just the few. And what does that mean to you? There's been a lot of conversation, even before the coronavirus, about a need to change capitalism. You had the Business Roundtable and others talking about companies needing to stand for something uh, beyond just profits. When you think about reimagining or reinventing capitalism, like, like what are the core tenets of it? How do we do that? What should be done? Yeah, and I think it's important, Jim, to take a step back from 
the day-to-day -day numbers and take a look sort of more broadly. So in 2018, we took a step back to reset our approach and really look at what's happening in the economy below the headline numbers. The headline numbers around GDP, around the Dow Jones Industrial Average might look good in some ways, but they actually are increasingly not representative of the real economy, what's happening to real people. So if you look underneath that, you see that GDP growth since 1980 has been slower than before 1980. You see the startup rate in America has dropped 16% in the last 15 years. See inequality, the statistics have been quite compelling about, uh, and this shows up predominantly, for instance, or very saliently in the wealth gap between white households and black households, which still is 10 times uh, the level of, uh, in white households than it was in black households 50 years after the landmark civil rights legislation of the 60s. So it's clear there's something else going on in the economy. And I think the pandemic has laid bare the rotten the floorboards of the economy beneath sort of the shiny top line numbers. Our estimate is that this is a set of structural things that have really contributed to that. And those three things are what we would say, one, a set of outdated ideas. This is the 50th anniversary of Milton Friedman publishing his landmark piece about the social responsibility of business. And we think those ideas are really past their sell-by date. The uh, economists have moved on. The society has, has a better understanding of how these ideas should work. Second is a piece that's not super remarked upon that much, but the, the notion of power, that power in the economy has been allowed to concentrate too much, we would argue, in terms of corporates and not enough in terms of alternative sources of power. It used to be workers were an alternative source of power in the economy, and that's no longer true 50 years later. And the third is when ideas come together with power, they create rules. And rules have been also written in, in ways that are not helpful to how the economy is working. A good example of this is one of the signal New Deal era laws uh, from the 1930s to create the National Labor Relations Act, which actually was, did a great job of protecting workers in formal employment in factories, but deliberately left out black uh, low-income domestic workers or immigrant workers uh, as a part of the compromise. And that's now a, a, a loophole in the economy that the gig economy has been driven through. And we see this with the essential workers uh, conversation now that's going on in light of the pandemic. So our take is that markets are not laws of physics. They are actually built by political economy and interests and power and ideas, which means they can be also rebuilt in different ways and unbuilt uh, in important ways as well. But is that just like a long way of saying like we need a lot more regulation or we need more, I think Freddie would say more socialism uh, in, in terms of our mentality about governance or is it different than that? Yeah, it's not simply about regulation. We would take it one, we would take it one step further up, which is to say um, we have, we come at this as capitalists who want to reimagine capitalism. And so underneath that, we've, we think there are five pillars, which are not specific policies, but aspects of the economy that need to be brought into a different balance than, than they are now. And so, first of all, even before you get to the idea of regulation, we've organized the economy around a, a narrow set of values around shareholder primacy and efficiency that's insufficient, doesn't reflect how Americans live their lives today. We need to also anchor the economy around shared values and ideas around dignity, around economic security. Uh, and around the freedom to engage in the economy and our democracy. Second, as I mentioned before with the NLRA, we need to build an economy that's inclusive uh, and takes on, you know, and takes actively, actively on the, uh, an anti-racist position to undo the legacies of the past. Third, and I think this is what your question gets at, we need to, we need to do some rebalancing of government markets and community, right? We've struck the balance in one direction heavily and that's led us to under-regulate, frankly, harmful economic monopolies. Concentration is up in 17 of 20 key economic sectors in the American economy. That's not good for competition. It's not good for dynamism. Fourth, we think there need to be count active counterweights, both in the economy and elsewhere, to concentrated power, uh, to government, you know, where it, where it happens, but also to corporate power. Uh, and so that's where we see, see issues like worker power being important. And finally, we think we need to modernize the economy to take into account today's massive disruptions, which weren't in account 50 years ago, climate, pandemics, technology. And so the way that AI rolls out in the workplace right now is a choice that we've made because of the way we prior, prioritize shareholders, but it doesn't have to be that way. 
in like in a crisp like sentence or two to your more liberal friends who would say, yeah, but like uh, basically capitalism is fatally flawed. Like defend capitalism. Like what is it? What is the best of capitalism that you believe uh, needs to continue to be protected and to thrive? Yeah, the best of capitalism is capitalism is a society to recognize is a is an understanding that recognizes our interdependence and that people are fundamentally interdependent and cooperative. But capitalism needs to then build on that in the best possible ways and provide guardrails where that cooperation can benefit uh, can benefit the 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 many and not the few. And so capitalism has provided terrific innovation. Uh, we've seen this coming from Silicon Valley. Capitalism provides. Uh, terrific uh, incentives if those incentives are bounded and 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 developed properly. And so we think uh, we think it's important not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But there are very many different kinds of capitalism than the one we have now, and we think we can get to a much better version. Mike, thank you for a fascinating conversation. Thank you to the Omidyar Network for making this broader conversation about reimagining capitalism possible. And back to you, Felix. Thanks, Jim. Uh, our next guest is the founder, chairman, and CEO of Operation Hope and Bryant Group Ventures. John Hope Bryant joins us from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, uh, John, welcome. Honored to be with you. Uh, I want to start, if I may, with a question that we received from an Axios reader in Los Angeles, California, who wrote in saying, would you say it's possible for most people to live in dignity under a capitalist system? I would say it's almost impossible to live in a system where you cannot express your self-determination, um, which is, you know, the, capitalism is a, is a horrible thing, just like uh, democracy. It's, just, it's a horrible thing except for every other thing. So I actually think that it is the, it, it's entirely possible. My life I think my life trajectory from Compton, California, and South Central LA and homeless at 18 shows that it's possible, probable, and even viable. But without the tools to compete in the game, it's actually painful and even cruel. So, of course, both can be true. You say, but I think you, it's you say probable? Like, I mean, I feel like your, your life trajectory is probably. not a probable one. It's like most no. people in... In, in your situation, don't wind up running, you know, major operations and uh, across the country and having the success that you've had. Uh, class, class mobility in the United States is lower than it has been in decades. I feel like the probability of that kind of story has been going down. Well, that's because the in eighteen. That's because our business plan is broken, not because the model is broken. In 1865, Abraham Lincoln created a Freedmen's Bank to, bank to teach free slaves about money. He was killed the next month. It wasn't like black people and brown people got the memo on free enterprise in my last book on capitalism and screwed it up. They just never got the memo. So we never learned entrepreneurship, small business ownership, wealth creation, all the things that people know in New York where you, you exist. So we, we protest on Main Street. We don't operate on Wall Street, uh, because not because we're not brilliant, because we never got the memo. Offline, we're talking about excellence. Where have we exceeded, succeeded? The arts and entertainment. In sports. Why? Because the playing field is level and the rules are published. The free enterprise and capitalism, the rules aren't published. So what we have got to do is teach financial literacy, uh, my new Marshall plan, K through college. We've got to teach free enterprise and capitalism. You can't just expect people to get it. If you hang around nine broke people, you'll be the 10th. So tell me about this Marshall plan, which I'm absolutely fascinated by. Um, you want to, you want a federal government program to invest into what America. and how? Tell, give me a big, give, give me give me the big picture. How 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 big of a plan is this? How much how much money are we spending here? Well, I think that it's at least half of the federal stimulus. I think the federal stimulus for the CARES Act, if you add in the Fed window, is about five trillion dollars. I think you, if you invested two to but one and a half to two and a half trillion dollars smartly. We just sort of threw that money at the problem as we had to. If you if you invest two trillion dollars smartly from infrastructure, uh, physical infrastructure to human infrastructure, uh, then you'll have the sort of impact GDP that you had after the new, the Marshall Plan of the World War II and in the New Deal uh, in the early 20th century. This is this is not a new plan; it's just a new time. 
and we just need to upgrade the software. Uh, all of the, the, the famed economists on both sides of, of the spectrum of thought have agreed that you can use government, you should use government spending in times like this to ramp up the economy in times of, uh, of, times of recession and, you know, borderline depression uh, if we don't do something about it. So, uh, so this would have, be this would be a, a two trillion, a roughly two trillion dollar one-off spending bill, investing in infrastructure and and cities and all manner of other glorious things, and that would cause an increase in economic activity because it's no. spending, and we can debate how much it would increase economic activity. But basically, once it was spent, it would be spent, and that's it. It's over. It's a one and done plan that you had. Uh, no, no, you're talking about two generation, two generations or more of impact. The, the the impact of the Marshall Plan, we're still feeling it because it gave every G, returning GI an, enough money to get a, a, a college education. Half this country is high school educated. That's just not sustainable. You need K through college for all people. It needs to be viewed as an investment, not as a cost, because when you have a high school educated population, you're at danger uh, of being a salute to the past, not a, a flag to the future. You need, you need to teach everybody to be uh, uh, basically a, a, a freedom fighter for their own self-reliance, which means they need education and financial literacy and the tools of the game. You need to re raise credit scores uh, 100 points across the board because 100% of these in-place uh, shootings with blacks and the police have been in 500 credit score neighborhoods. All of our problems, white, rural, and black and brown urban, are in 500 credit score neighborhoods. All of them. So if you literally raise the credit scores, the economic vibration, the energy in these neighborhoods, a hundred points, you you solve eighty percent of all social problems, and that you boost. Sounds your sounds awesome. So give me give me a how here. If I'm if I'm in the neighborhood with a five hundred credit score, what kind of public policy is going to raise that to six hundred? Uh, number one, you need to get financial literacy training and education. Number two, we need to farm club the things that create GDP from middle school, not just football and basketball and baseball, but how, how to be an engineer, uh, to be uh, a, a business manager, uh, uh, to be uh, the things that real estate, finance, the things that drive GDP, healthcare, those careers need to be farm club from middle school, high school, into college, and then connect with an internship and an apprenticeship, and then connect the streets to the suites. If you give massive intern, uh, massive tax, uh, uh, not relief, but incentives for uh, internships, I'm talking about tens of thousands, in millions, not hundreds, not tokenism, uh, then you're going to get a pop effect because uh, one, once the streets have a relationship with the suites, you're going to have a, 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 a funnel of opportunity. You also need to get a really so what one of the, well, well, let me just jump in here. Like one, one of the um, things that we were just talking to Representative Jayapal from Washington State, and she was pointing to Germany as a uh, model here. Obviously, Germany has for decades, if not centuries, had a mentorship and apprenticeship system. Um, do, do you think that Germany is the kind of country you're looking towards as a kind of you want to get moved more in that direction, those, that kind of system of apprenticeships and masters? I think America is the system I'm looking for. I mean, look, Goldman Sachs with a guy named Goldman and a guy named Sachs is selling stuff door to door in the early 1900s. Walmart was a guy with a high school education and a storefront. We need we need to remember every big business was once a small one, Felix. And we need to we need a massive push on small business and entrepreneurship. I'm about to launch a one million black business initiative in the next few weeks through as part of the Marshall Plan. We need a massive push on what made us great in the first place, which was the New Deal. After you know, like I said early 19 in the early uh, 1900s, I was poor whites by the way, 100 percent who were protesting and rioting in the streets because they thought that the model wasn't working for them. They were rewarded after World War II with the Marshall Plan. The, the white middle class today came out of the Marshall Plan. We, we, need, to re, we need to remember our own business plan uh, and get about that business. And Germany, by the way, is benefited from the Marshall Plan as well. Germany and Japan were rebuilt by us after World War II, as well as France. I, I, it was the case, though, that in the 1940s and 50s, fiscal policy seemed to go a lot further than it can today. It's hard to look at any country or any fiscal plan anywhere in the world that, no matter how big it's been, especially if you look at Japan, has been able to have anything like the kind of effect that the Marshall Plan had in, in the 40s and 50s. Have we not kind of learned that that, tool in our toolbox is not nearly as effective today as it was 
50 years ago or 60 years ago? Well, you're right, but it's a different time. You're right that, the, that physical policy does, it does not go far, far as far as it did back then, but you're not as right because human potential has gone, has, has sparked by that and by our own entrepreneurship, has built the largest economy in the world. For all our problems in the U.S., and there are plenty of them, America is the sole superpower and the largest economy in the world at 350 million people. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. So the entrepreneurship lift here, the, I mean, this is still the safe haven for the dollar. Uh, you guys just reported that in the world. So if we can get our act straight and get our business plan straight, everybody wants to be an American, but Americans, we need to stop arguing with each other over stupid stuff like race. I mean, this is nuts. I mean, this benefits China and Russia. It doesn't benefit us. Just get our business plan straight, do 10 things, no, five things right, be focused on it. 90% of jobs, as you know, comes from the private sector, not government. The world is different since 1950 and 1940. Uh, but but the government can use can be seen as a spark to get us out of this mess. So one of the things you want to do as part of this Marshall Plan is to revamp the Community Reinvestment Act and to try and get banks to um, reinvest more in what? Tell me about that part of the plan. Well, you cannot have a growing economy without a banking system. That's 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 world history. So what I want banks to do, CRA has already been modernized. I had a little bit of a hand in that with the comptroller uh, auditing. Uh, they, they, what they need to do now is focus it, focus the benefit. Again, we respond by by incentives and penalties. So let's incentivize for, for X banks to raise credit scores. The nonprofits they work with that deliver credit score increases get another grant. Those that don't, get don't get a renewal of the grant. The banks who raise credit scores in neighborhoods get an attaboy from the government or, or the lack thereof. Uh, things that, that create jobs, economic opportunity, GDP, credit score increases, uh, and basically- Wait, are you, uh, saying, are you saying giving grants to banks? You're saying give four times, no, no, no. give a grant to a bank? No. No, no. no. Well, what's, what's, being, bank, what's being multiplied by four here? The, the banks give grants to the to community leaders and community groups like Operation Hope, which is a, the national, national leader in coaching in the nation. And the federal government gives an attaboy to the bank through the Community Reinvestment Act, through their, their regulatory rating, which allows them to merge, grow, expand uh, their enterprise. So the more they do for the community in a targeted fashion, in a smart fashion, the more they're given liberalization, flexibility to grow their platform. So the most effective banks can become even bigger than they are right now. And they're creating customers because we're talking about two to three percent of GDP, in my opinion, as sitting on the sidelines. I mean, how much wealth is, I, it, Bloomberg thinks is 1.7 trillion is sitting on the sidelines because black people since slavery forward have been on the economic sidelines in America. Don't look at this as a cost. Look at it as an investment in untapped economic potential. So banks are, are, are you have 130 million people with a, 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 a battered financial picture. Those are customers. A saint is a sinner that got up. Those are future customers, and we need to see them as such. Uh, what is a drug dealer, if not an illegal, unethical entrepreneur? They understand import, export, finance, marketing, wholesale, retail, customer service, security, territory, and logistics. I mean, these are brilliant people and, with a bad role models. Uh, as Roland Fryer has, has demonstrated. Um, John O'Brien, thank you very much for joining us here on Axios. It's been a pleasure having you. Well, it's not been boring. <laughs> My pleasure. Our final guest is the director of Harvard University's Edmund Safra Center for Ethics. She also is involved in Harvard's Democratic Knowledge Project. Professor Danielle Allen is here in coming to us from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Welcome, Danielle. Thanks a lot, Felix. And if I may, I'd like to start with a question that we got from an Axios reader in Atlanta saying, just a small question here, what is the best way to curb the growth of income inequality? So the, what we really need to do is to shift our focus in our economic policy from questions of distribution and redistribution to production, I would say. And we really need to. Sorry, what you're saying is I'm asking the wrong question here. I shouldn't be care. I shouldn't care no, about no. inequality. No, 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 question. No, 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 okay. not at all. But it's just that to fix income inequality, 
that's not, I mean, we're better off focusing on production actually in the first instance than on jumping straight to questions of redistribution. That is, we need to re-empower labor uh, in the context of production so that the settlements made uh, as firms structure employment are already in themselves fair. Um, If we can do that, we can start shifting the sort of uh, productivity gains, the sort of distribution productivity gains um, back in a more egalitarian direction already as a part of the process of production. Um, So rather than accepting a kind of structure of employment that in itself delivers inequitable results, um, we want to reorganize the structure of employment. And we've talked about this a little bit, um, the way that employment is structured and especially uh, the way that employment around essential workers has been structured just doesn't help anyone, really. Right. Well, I mean, I think there are many uh, economists have made this point that over the course of the 20th century, labor's bargaining power was substantially eroded, and that has been a real driver of income inequality. You can see that in a certain sense insofar as the norm has set in in the corporate context that profits, even over 14, 15, 50 percent sort of return on investment, are acceptable, where one might think it was a reasonable thing to achieve a norm where the expectation was that once your profits are at that level, that really ought to be fed back into um, your your worker base. Um, so recognizing uh, that there should be a norm of sort of expecting profit to kind of max out at you know sort of 13, 14 percent return on investment. Although if the people making the excess profits, uh, you know, Apple Computer and Goldman Sachs, that doesn't really help us very much. Those, those workers are doing just fine. Um, that's certainly true, um, but it's also possible to focus, uh, you know, on a concept of stakeholder capitalism instead of shareholder capitalism. We've heard some in the news lately about stakeholder capitalism. And if you focus that way, then any given firm has a bigger community of people and bigger sort of list of folks who are impacted by its decisions. And so then the question of where to invest is a question of how to invest in all the stakeholders for the firm, not just the shareholders. And that can mean investment in the specific communities um, in which those firms are cited. It can mean investment in the public infrastructure that sustains the broader social system in which the firms operate. So I think if we can shift our mindset from a shareholder to stakeholder capitalism mindset, um, that would be very productive. My colleague, Rebecca Henderson, here at Harvard Business School, has a very compelling account of what the sort of concrete steps are to achieve stakeholder rather than shareholder capitalism. And are those concrete steps, do those have to get taken by... Congress? Or is that something that like Apple and Goldman Sachs can do unilaterally? Um, It's certainly something they could do unilaterally. So without any question, um, I mean, there's a, a room for shifting sort of corporate purpose and corporate understandings of purpose. And in some sense, that's why I invoked Rebecca at Harvard Business School, because you can actually see in the curriculum of Harvard Business School over the shape, course of the 20th century, you know, shareholder capitalism emerged from a curriculum. It's not as if right. it just sort of fell from the heavens, you know, like in some sui generis way. It was taught and created. And in a similar fashion, we have to, I think, um, in, invest in education, reorienting corporate practice towards stakeholder capitalism. That means different kinds of metrics, actually. So it's not necessarily about sort of quarterly returns to shareholders. It's about um, a fuller account of corporate purpose and building metrics um, that support that. That doesn't mean that Congress is off the hook, that it's all a private sector matter. I think um, it's really important to ask the question of which kinds of responsibilities fall in which laps. And in terms of the, what what Congress has to do, um, what we've learned over the course of this crisis is that there's a huge amount of work to be done on just public health and testing, and this is your area of expertise. Tell us a little bit about what we've learned since March in terms of the health infrastructure of this country. Well, it's very clear that we, when we, the pandemic hit, this economy was not pandemic resilient. That is, the pandemic was a huge exogenous shock. And the reason we couldn't simply process the shock and rebound swiftly was because we don't have the infrastructure of public health 
that can rapidly deliver suppression for a novel infectious pathogen. We have a public health infrastructure that's something akin to, I would say, a network of country roads. And when the pandemic hit, we needed to convert that network of country roads into something the equivalent of an interstate highway system in a matter of weeks. That's a big ask. It wasn't an impossible ask. If you have the right kind of public good commitment, um, it was an in principle doable thing. So the question we really have to ask ourselves is why did the country not have an orientation towards the public good and a readiness to make a substantial public good investment to achieve that pandemic resilient public health infrastructure right at the get go? And when you ask that question, I think what you see is that we've spent so much time for the last few decades asking how we can privatize solutions that we literally don't know how to think about public good commitments and investments any longer. So that's the really key thing. And if you look at who's suffered from the pandemic and who's safe, you see a real pattern of who has market power. So we have the NBA living in a bubble. We have the NFL functioning in a bubble. We have essential workers devastated by the pandemic. We have school children not able to go to school, suffering immensely. And both of those categories, it's a clear public goods need. We needed to suppress the disease as a country, deliver personal protective equipment to essential workers. That needed public goods investment. Um, so much of our response has been about private sector public partnerships. Those are laudable. It's great that CVS has really ramped up testing, but it's in some sense been at the margins. And we have like this big donut hole around where we needed public investment in the public good of a rapid buildup of disease suppression infrastructure. I remember reading headlines about this amazing new testing regimen that was developed by NBA. I'm like, I've never heard of this pharmaceutical company called NBA. It was a sports thing. And I was like, wait, this is not making any sense. But you're right. Like, that's where the development winds up happening if it's not happening in the public sector. We, I was talking earlier to Representative Jayapal from Washington State about like other models for this. And when you talk about a pandemic resilient healthcare infrastructure, are there any what what are the countries that spring to mind that kind of happen to have got this right? Well, both Taiwan, South Korea spring to mind, as does Germany. And so I'll point out to different things that each of them succeeded in. So Germany, when the pandemic was nearing, not even quite when it had hadn't quite hit yet, but they knew it was coming. The first thing they did in their federal system was invest in an in IT upgrade for all of their local public health offices because they understood that they needed the entire country functioning effectively with data and with a shared structure for handling data. To date in this country, we have not achieved that shared data foundation. So that's a kind of key example of infrastructure that we need that really has to be done at a national level. Uh, there's no substitute for doing it at a national level. In South Korea, they really understand the rapidity, the speed with which you need to connect diagnostic testing to contact tracing. And again, that's a lesson that we watched. We watched the process unfold. We know what we need to do. We haven't been able to do it yet. So just to finish up on this one, how what, what's the best way to move to a much more centralized system of letting the public sector look after public goods and not trying to rely on the private sector for essential services like education and public health. Like, how do we get there from here? You know, especially given where we are in America, because these things are very path dependent. So I want to make a distinction. We have two different things operating. There's sort of private sector versus public sector. And then there's centralized from decentralized. And we sometimes sort of glom together public and centralized, but we don't have to actually. Our federal structure is very powerful. That's why I like the German example. The question is how do we harmonize the functions and responsibilities at the different levels and layers of our system and align those different functions around a public good concept. So to some extent, honestly, I think we just have to open space in people's imagination for the concept of the public good. Instead of saying, how can we privatize that? We should be asking the question of, what is that, how, do we, how do we tell what's a public good? When can we spot the need for a public good? You know, we need to sort of get our muscles going for just plain naming public goods. And substantial investment in public health infrastructure is a public good. Then how do we deliver it? 
Federal government needs to invest, needs to support data systems. States, however, need to build out the on the ground, boots on the ground, organizational implementation, rebuild the sort of practices of their public health um, organizations in order to deliver those goods in practice as services. Which obviously is hard when states have um, balanced budget constitutional requirements and we're in the middle of a recession and they have no money, but with any luck, the federal government might be able to come in and help them on that front. You you yeah. delegate, you distribute the funding from the federal government to the states and then let the states sort of take care of it. That's right. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So recognize that the federal government has the job of providing that macroeconomic stability uh, in a context where they have flexibility that states don't have. They also have the higher level of resource from the tax base and so forth and more capacity to adjust over time, um, yet leave the structured implementation uh, in context to the states. You can still also provide guidance. And indeed, um, a national data structure is fundamental. Um, if you have a national structure laying out metrics, what people should be focusing on, that also starts to drive practice in a harmonized way. Um, but the question of how given states organize literal processes of their institutions, their public health labs, their, their health centers, and so forth, that really is context specific, and it has to be well aligned with community norms. That really does depend on states to get it right. Um, but if we can focus on the concept of harmonization, federalism as harmonization, then we stand a chance of getting our public infrastructure operating to deliver public goods. Professor Daniel Allen, thank you very much. And thank all of you for joining this afternoon for another virtual conversation that I dearly hope has made everyone smarter, faster. Thank you to our sponsor, Omedia, for making this conversation possible. For the latest news, on everything that matters, go to Axios.com or download the Axios app. Sign up for the Axios newsletters. Please sign up for my Axios newsletter, which, if I do say so myself, is excellent. It's called Axios Capital. They're all sign upable, if that's the word, at signup.axios.com. We are going to have another event next Wednesday on the future of the media landscape. We're going to talk about how companies are creating trust and transparency online through attribution. Thank you again, once again, for joining, and we will see you on Axios.com.